This is that dead air part. Gets better every week I hear it, honest to goodness. 71 weeks in a row, SIP Educational Wine Series is live again. And let's begin this Friday night uh, with the way we begin every Friday night. Famous Chicago Bears numbered 71, because as a former Chicagoan, I have to continue you know, to live respectfully through the Bears. And I know in the chat, people are gonna be chiming in on who they think it is. It has to be Big Cat Williams. 71, Big Cat was the man. Sean Manning, by the way, if you're on, he actually goes by the name Big Cat. Hans and Caitlin Greasier in the house and mom and dad, Jeff and Jane Greasier in the house. Don't draw any conclusions. No judging that the whole family is drinking together in different parts of the country. It's okay. Jessica, oh, Jessica, you're gonna have to help me with that one. Maitri, Maitri, Karen Athanas, Kath, Catherine Jurica, Laura Sardis, Lori Potney. By the way, Lori won all of the money last week because she got both trivia questions correct. And as a tiebreaker this week, we have three trivia questions. Mikhail Cabral, Nicholas Harding, Peter Glick in the house from Chicago. I like this crowd already. Uh, we are thrilled to have everyone here. My name is Martin Cody, co-founder and SIP host and tour director of this evening, but co-founder of Seller Angels. And for those of you that are new, Seller Angels is a direct-to-consumer company specializing exclusively in wines from Napa and Sonoma, most generally of the limited production format like the two young ladies we have this evening. So these are wines that are not readily available throughout the country, but are fantastic, have amazing stories, and we love telling their stories. So for those of you that are wondering how I have the wine and how many of the people in the audience have the wine, you have to go over to the Cellar Angels website, and I will show that to you because it's extremely simple. If you click on the right screen and then pull up the Cellar Angels website, you will see that we focus on the artisan winemakers and we have one here this evening, but you can just simply go down to shop, go down to wine, click on wines and you will see what is probably our best selling item, the sip kit. So the sip kit will have five wines in it. It's your next five Fridays in a row where you can sit down, relax, drink with the winemaker, ask questions and get everything from a knowledge standpoint you wanted to know about these limited production wineries direct from the source. Unprecedented. Tonight, we're talking about the Guderian Wines 2019 Chenin Blanc, and we are going to go deep into Chenin, deep into the personal relationship of the two ladies that are producing this, how they got here, why they're doing this, what they might be doing instead of this. Good days, bad days. Uh, they have the elixir of wine to make everything better. So with that, I want to introduce our first, our first two guests, our only two guests this evening. Uh, this is Shana Harding, winemaker of Guderian, and Natalie Hall, Vintner. Actually, that should say Natalie Coughlin because we did one over that yesterday. So cheers to both of you. <laughs> Thank you for spending some Friday with us. I already need more. There's Sean Manning in Payroll Vault. Uh, Sean Big Cat Williams player. Just want to make certain you know. Sean also in Colorado. Uh, all right. So let me throw this out to the two of you for everybody to recognize how these two ladies met with each other or met each other, their fathers swam together in college. Husbands. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and mine's watching right now, so. <laughs> are, are you 100% are you positive your dads didn't know each other, just for clarification? Yes, I don't think my dad's a very good swimmer. Sorry, dad. <laughs> they're, they're, and that, hey, dad, I already like your father. Uh, <laughs> So their husbands swam to, with each other. Where was this? Was this in like a farm pond or was this competitive? UCSB. Um, they were both uh, swimmers down at UCSB and that's how uh, we met through our husbands. Wow. Okay. So competitive collegiate swimming. <laughs> Those are three words that have never followed my name, nor will they <laughs> in any offspring that I could potentially have. So how many years ago was this? Gosh, it was right after Shana and Nick got married. Did we get married so, in 2006 or 2007? <laughs> so about 15 years almost. Well, so. Yeah, almost. Yeah, or yeah, more. Okay. Um, thank you. That's my husband, 2007. <laughs> thank you. Let the record, let the, and by the way, this is being recorded for posterity. So let the record reflect that the husband knew the anniversary date oh, and not the wife. Way better at that stuff than I am. So yes. 
<laughs> All right. So this was this was 2007. So Shana, you got to the valley. It was a 2006 Eight. or seven. So 2008 was my first vintage. Um, and um, we, I moved to California in 2007. Um, okay. And so, uh, yeah. And then it was, it was 10 years later that Natalie and I started Gadarian. So yeah. Awesome. And you there. came, you came from New York where yes. you were uh, attempting to have a musical career. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I mean that impressively, by the way, because you left Florida to pursue a musical career. So there in and of itself is uh, a, quite a bit of courage. How old were you when you left Florida? I was 21. So um, that's incredible to me because so oh, you, leave, you leave Jacksonville and you say, you know what, uh, hope and a dream, I'm going to the Big Apple. Yeah, of course, where else would I go? Uh, it's a good point, Nashville. <laughs> um, yeah. So, no, um, I, I loved New York City. Um, I, I had been when I was younger, you know, when you're in Florida, it's not that far of a flight. And I just said to myself, as soon as I'm done with college, go to New York City, see what I can do. And so um, I am not currently a musician, but I did uh, meet my husband there. I did get a major wine education there. Um, so it, it turned out to be a, a great thing. And was, was the major wine education as a starving artist consumer or was there an educational component? Yes and yes. So uh, oh, both. Good. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I was when, when you go to New York to be a musician, you still have to make money. So I worked in restaurants and I bartended and I waited tables and I worked for a restaurant group that had a wine college. Um, and Laura Manick was in charge of that at the time. She was the only female master psalm in New York City. Yep. And I was just smitten with her. I thought, what a cool person. And I love learning about wine and, and it, everything seemed to click. And so, um, so I did that with the restaurant group. And then I went on um, at NYU and I took some sensory courses there as well. So I was able to, to get that kind of education. And then also working in fine dining, I was able to, um, to drink some wines that I wouldn't be able to afford otherwise. I still can't afford those wines. So, yeah. uh, but it's always good when they're on someone else's educational dime. Yeah. So, so Natalie, your, your route to wine took a little bit of a different path. You actually, you know, were, grew up and were raised not too far from wine country. So it wasn't exactly a distant thing, but how did you come to wine appreciation at a level to where you thought, okay, maybe I, I want to do something in this? Yeah, so I grew up in Vallejo, which is just outside Napa Valley, and my parents are really into wine. And um, back then on the weekends, like usually after church, we would go wine tasting or go pick up some of their wines. And um, it was uh, normal back then in the or late 80s, early 90s to do that, bring your kids with you. And um, I was exposed to it that way. Obviously, I wasn't drinking. I was playing in the vineyards at that point. Um, but when I became of drinking age, uh, I was at school in Berkeley and I wanted to learn more about wine. And so when I did have some free time, I would get up to the valley as much as possible and just taste and learn and um, ask lots of questions. And um, one of the best things that I ever did was when I would find um, a very friendly uh, person who was pouring, who like took me under their wing, I would ask them like, can you give me three other places to visit? And they would give me places knowing that I was someone who was interested in wine and that would be welcomed by uh, people within the industry. Cause it, it could be uh, very intimidating for anybody, but especially when you're 21 and you want to learn about something, you don't want to just drink to, to drink. You want to learn about this thing that so many people love. No, and it's, it's funny you talk about that at Berkeley, and I'm curious, is in the entire California university system, is wine just ubiquitous? Is, is it because of the industry and agricultural industry standpoint, is it their courses are focused on that and it's just there's programs or is it Davis, you know, and a couple other universities? Yeah, it's, it's Davis. Um, Berkeley, they have food science and stuff like that since I've graduated, but they don't have a viticulture program. Uh, uh, program as far as I know, at least they did definitely did it when I was there. Right. And so Shana, you come out to California and because of the introduction of wine in New York, uh, you, you got to have a couple, you know, we refer to them as wine epiphanies where you realize, whoa, there is a lot going on in this glass that uh, my $8 bottle of wine is not normally producing when, when you have some of those Bergs and Bordeaux and some of the higher end stuff. So did you come out to California? 
California from New York with the intent that I need to be in this industry? No, um, not at all, actually. Um, I, when I first came out to California, I tried to get a real job and I worked for Standard and Poor's um, and I was miserable. Um, and I <laughs> kind of thought to myself, what do I, what do I love learning about? And, and, and easy answer was wine. And so I came up to Napa I went to a job fair at Domaine Chandon and I said, I want to work the harvest and they were cool. And they said, okay, go ahead. So, um, so I did. And then I just stayed in Napa. So I've been, um, been working either in production or um, in back office and tasting rooms and in, in the wine industry since 2008. And uh, that year I decided I needed to go to UC Davis. So I started re going to school um in my mid-20s and i um and i ended up going um to uc davis while while living in napa i commuted to davis and i worked in saint helena uh on the weekends oh, and wow. i was in davis during the week and i lived in in downtown napa so it was a little crazy um uh, but i'm so glad i did it um and um i just haven't looked back it's it's been an awesome uh an awesome ride so far and and natalie when did you graduate berkeley um, I graduated, uh, Oh five. Okay. So, uh, when did you start? Oh, two. I started oh. in 2000. So I took, um, I took two semesters off for the Olympics in 2004, um, and then went back, which was awful. <laughs> Just taking a year break was hard enough. So I couldn't imagine going back, uh, take being graduated and for several years and then going back and redoing uh, your undergraduate degree, which what Shana did, which was so admirable. And at the time I was like, wow, that's amazing that she's doing this. And I, uh, I feel like I, I was just so impressed by um, finding your passion and then really attacking it. Well, and, and I think both of you have that characteristic and, and Natalie, you're, for lack of a better phrase, I mean, you're an elite performer. You, you, if anybody doesn't know this already, you attended three Olympics, uh, which attending, even qualifying for one is amazing, but to attend and compete in three and win medals in all three of them, uh, I mean, it is just absolutely nearly beyond description. So from an elite performance standpoint, you get all the prep, you get all the dedication, you get all the sacrifice, the persistence, the grit, the leaning into everything. And I think, Shane, in a different capacity, so do you. Because kind of to what Natalie was just talking about, I mean, you picked up from Jacksonville, Florida, which understandable, uh, you <laughs> moved to hold, hold all the letters from Jacksonville, please. Uh, you moved to New York at 21 to, to lean into a musical career and it didn't pan out, but then you found another vocation and then you, you know, moved across country and picked it up again. Uh, that takes a lot of grit. That, that takes a lot of character and perseverance. And I think it lends itself well that you two have come together in an industry that actually semi rewards that. And it's a, it's a necessary component as a startup company, because both of you know, and the angels know that this isn't an easy vocation. Uh, the odds are stacked against you from a, from a material handling standpoint, from a cost of production standpoint, from, from bottles pricing and all that stuff. So you really have to have that perseverance. And I'll go with Natalie on this first. What is a, a lesson that you learned in, in three Olympics and swimming and practice and sacrifice that has you know, served you well in this new vocation of Guderian? Oh my gosh, so much has actually translated. Um, it like that was successful for me in my athletic career that's been successful here. Um, patience is a big part of it. Um, when you're an Olympian, you set these goals that are years down the road, like years and years and years, and you're going to hit bumps, uh, along the way, which there, those are inevitable, but what separates, um, one of the many things that separates like the true champions from everyone else is the ability to push through, uh, those plateaus, the, um, willingness to accept, uh, your, your lumps, um, uh, to accept those failures and, figure out like, okay, this is a failure. How can I improve upon this? How can I use this as a learning experience? Um, all those things really help you uh, in, in business in general, but uh, in, in our business, like, I mean, patience is everything. We're, we're now finally releasing this 2019 cab that, um, you know, we harvested two years ago. Like, it's so exciting. Like, God, we've been wanting to share this forever, but it's, it's two years in the making. And um, the patience and then the ability to pivot. Um, it has been really, really important, I think, 
uh, pivoting, uh, you know, we started with, with Shannon and, and Pino and we've gone all these other directions that we're very, very proud of. And um, since 2017, it's been, it's been pretty crazy in, in, in the Valley um, for various oh, reasons. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only so, thing, the only thing missing is a hailstorm and locusts, but other than that, just about everything else is uh, surfaced. And Shana, what about We had you? hail earlier this year too. We had hail in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so we do have so, some low yields this year, um, partially due to the hail that happened after bud, uh, not bud, after flowering, um, in a couple of the vineyards. So interesting. Yeah, we just need the locusts. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm trying to hold off on those. The angels yeah. usually have a direct, a direct path to a higher authority. So we'll, we'll keep the locusts at bay, but Shana, do you draw on anything from kind of you know, the last 15 years of, of grit and perseverance and, and relentless pursuit and doggedness to, I think the patience, Natalie, that you mentioned is spot on because there's so much in farming outside of your control uh, and, and having the, the discipline to be patient. But Shana, you've been doing this now for, you know, 15 plus years or so. What have you learned from your past that helps you accommodate to all of the changes that exist in this industry right now? Oh, yeah, I think it's just, so... I've really learned certain areas where you must be prepared um, if you want to be successful, but you can't take things personally or you can't, uh, you can't hold on to the way that you wanted them to be because you're at the uh, whim of mother nature. So I have definitely learned always be prepared, have a plan for what you want to do, but need to be flexible. So I feel like at this point in my career, no matter what happens, um, I'm pretty sure I can, I can turn whatever it is into something. Right. So, um, so I'll have an idea of what we want to do. Like, for example, this year, uh, we really wanted to co-ferment, um, a little bit of Merlot with Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and so ideally we would be able to pick that fruit at the same time. Um, but also it's more important that we pick it when it's ripe, like perfectly ripe. We want the phenolic ripeness. We don't want it to be over. We don't want it to be under. So, um, it didn't happen exactly at the right time, but we were able to be flexible and come up with solutions. So we were able to chill down um, the must from the Merlot that came in a couple days earlier. And then when the Cabernet came in, we were still able to do our co-ferment. So we're still getting these like crazy color, beautiful aromatic that we're fermenting right now. Um, but it's not exactly how we planned it. And that's okay. Like we just need to kind of right. move through it. So essentially the bottom line is you just have to roll with the punches no matter what yeah. comes out. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, just be, try to be ready for anything and uh, you'll, and, cause you'll need to be pretty much. And Natalie, I know your children are two and nine months. Shana, how old is your, how, five. How old is, five. I, your children don't stand a chance against either of you. Just, just <laughs> for the record. Cause no. you, you both, you're going to be like, yeah, just deal with it. Stop. Go, go on. Toughen up a little bit. Oh, I can no. notice <laughs> It's not easy. I mean, this business is, is not easy and you're, you're both so impressed, impressive at it. And I, and I love what you've done so far. And with that, I want to just introduce the first poll question because we've got a lot of questions to get to. So you two can't answer uh, until the end. I'll take it. So I'll take a sip. <laughs> um, those of you, Jessica, this is new. Everyone's got to get their hands on the computer. Laura Sardis, I know Sean knows how to do this. In its heyday, Shannon Black during the 70s, California had how many acres under vine for Shannon? And most of us had parents that had a bottle called Chablis that might have had a candle in it. Uh, and if your parents had a VW bug, they had more than one. Mm -hmm. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Shana and Natalie, anybody want to fathom a guess on how many acres under vine in the 70s when Shannon was at its heyday? Well, I know that um, in the early 1970s, there was more Shannon Blanc planted in California than there was in the Loire. So I would just guess the highest number. I was going to go the over. So yeah, whatever that is, 60,000. The answer, sadly, to the audience's dismay is 30,000. Son of a bitch. Oh. <laughs> so, okay. uh, there's no worry Shana there's a seven second delay with the networks you're fine I'm sure someone in, I'm sure someone no in New York will, will get that all good so interestingly enough 
30,000 acres in its heyday. And there was two things that brought down the demise of Shannon. Any guesses? One event happened in 1976. Are we supposed to answer? Do we want, do yes, you want? You, you too. Oh, the painting of Paris. I thought somebody else Thank was you. gonna do it. Thank you. I thought, <laughs> I, I, thought I lost my mic carpet. for a second. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I thought you were yep, saying yep. Not, to, not to answer. <laughs> no, you can answer the follow-up questions. Jeff okay. Greasy, Judge, oh, sure. Judgment of Paris. And the second thing that actually really was essentially the final nail in the coffin of Chablis was the invention of white Zinfandel. They just started ripping up Chablis wow, vineyards. Wow, and now wow. thankfully they're, they're come, I'm sorry, they, well, they started ripping up Chablis vineyards. They started ripping up Chenin Blanc vineyards, very few Chablis vineyards. Uh, but now, interestingly enough, Shana, you were telling us in Napa, there is the Chenin Blanc vineyards are on the rise. So what were they and what are they? Yeah, so um, Chenin Blanc for a long time was becoming less and less. People were replanting where they had Chenin. Um, and so when Natalie and I started producing the Guderian Chenin Blanc, there was only seven acres planted to Chenin in the Napa AVA. Um, so we were super thrilled to be able to get into this old heritage vineyard. Um, and it has doubled as of 2020. So there are 14 acres planted, which in the grand scheme of things is nothing. But um, still, um, it, it definitely means there's a demand. And so we're excited. I mean, we want to promote planting Shannon and, and people drinking Shannon because it grows so nicely in Napa, such beautiful, ripe, aromatic. Like it, it just, it's, it's fantastic how it is here in Napa. So um, hopefully there's, there's more and more and it's on the rise. I, I hope so too. And it's interesting because at its low in California, it went down to below 5,000 acres under vine. So I don't know where it is for a state, but the fact that there's only 14 acres in Napa and we're going to get to kind of the origin of Chenin Blanc in France in, in a minute. Uh, it's a good time now since no one got the first poll question, right? To, for a little redemption and people can lick their chops and their wounds uh, and hopefully no swearing in this one. Um, <laughs> the beauty of the Chenin Blanc, specifically this Chenin from Guderian is what? The wine's versatility with food, 50 year old vines. It is one of the most competitively priced Shenans in the Valley. Sorry, Chapel A. Um, not available retail. You can only get this from them or us type of thing for the most part. All of the above. See now, since the first one was a little bit of a toughie, we thought we threw a softball at everybody now, uh, but apparently two individuals are struggling. So, <laughs> Um, we won't call you out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we might. Uh, so five, four, three, two, one. A absolutely. Yay. Um, all of the above <laughs> is the correct answer because, and, and, and Shana, you can talk about the versatility with food and, and so can you, Natalie, and I'll, I'll go Shana first from a food standpoint and versatility. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and Natalie will probably be able to answer this better than me because she is such the foodie. Um, but Chenin Blanc, it, it pairs very well across the spectrum. Um, and so in my household, um, I'm a vegetarian. My husband and my son are pescatarian. So not that my son would drink wine yet, uh, but, um, but thanks for the qualifier at five years yeah. of age. It, it, it pairs with pretty much anything that we're going to prepare. Um, it, you know, if you have something kind of greasy fried fatty, which, you know, I'm from Jacksonville. Um, so we <laughs> like that. Um, if you have uh, something that's lighter, fresh citrus, that type of note, like it, it pairs perfectly with that. And if you have something that's a little heartier, um, more like your big stinky cheeses, um, the nice acidity really helps cut through that. So it, it has a very wide swath of pairability, which is fantastic. And Natalie, yeah, what have you found from a, and by the way, Natalie, in addition to, this is where Natalie will never have the term slacker next to her name, as opposed to me, three-time Olympic champion, uh, 12 medals, also a cookbook author and competed on Dancing with the Stars. And Martin, what have you done? <laughs> you drink a lot of good wine. That's what you do. I do drink good wine. Uh, but so for, in your cooking, and you have a great cookbook called Cook to Thrive. 
So I recognize, obviously, and by the way, all kidding aside, everyone at Seller Angels knows that Mission Control and I, I mean, food is fuel. We treat it very, very seriously. So we, we recognize good ingredients, especially you pay the farmer, uh, locally sourced, organic. It all makes a huge difference in your health, but also when you're pairing it with wine. So what have you found from a, with your food and culinary background, why is this wine so versatile? Well, when you're drinking it, um, it like your mouth salivates, like it has such a nice acidity that um, makes you salivate and makes you want food. And so like Shana was saying, like it go, could go really well with fried foods. It could go really well with seafood. Um, it could go well with so many different things because it kind of cleanses the palate as, as you're eating. Um, in, in my cookbook, one of my favorite recipes is actually a recipe from my great grandma, um, she was alive until I was in college, which I was very uh, fortunate in that. Um, and it's called ukoi, and it's a uh, Filipino style shrimp fritter. And so it has that seafood comp component, it has that fried component. Um, and Shannon has um, this like perceived sweetness because it has like all those like tropical, like honeyed aromas. But this is a dry wine, like there's no residual sugar in this. Um, but because of that perceived sweetness, it goes so well with shrimp because shrimp tastes sweet and those like delicate white fishes taste sweet. So that's, that's one of my favorite pairings is either a shrimp or a really delicate white fish. Well, and it's interesting too, what most people don't know about Shannon. And I think they're probably their exposure to it in Napa is most likely from Pine Ridge and, and they produce, you know, tens of thousands of bottles of that great Shannon, by the way. And uh, they might have the other seven acres if you got, although they probably source from outside of Napa. Uh, they do, but, yeah. They get yeah. Their, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. No, 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 you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, and when you, if you look at Shannon's origin in the Loire Valley and, and you look at the way that the Loire is broken up into four different segments and you have dry wine, you have semi-dry wine. Uh, it, it does have that minerality and that keens and flintiness to it. It does have the body that you're talking about, Natalie, that pairs well with, with not only the, the white fish and, the, and actually spicy Thai food as well, because it has that sweetness component. So it can counteract the heat, but then, and most people don't recognize this or even know this, they will let it grow and, you know, can contract Boitritis. And it's an absolute amazing dessert wine as well. It is the most planted grape in South Africa. So it has a huge um, renaissance, if you will, with regards to beginning popularity. We just need to increase it more here in the United States. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Henry Ranch and, and how you came about finding the, you know, four or five acres that are producing Shen in the Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. Natalie, how did you come up? Oh, I'm sorry, Shannon, how did you find that place? Sure, yeah. Um, so it's really um, through connections with uh, growers and colleagues that I've worked with uh, making wine uh, for other brands. Uh, I'm currently involved with making wine for 18 different wine brands. Um, and so I, I have a lot of exposure to a whole bunch of different growers and um, uh, as well as a whole bunch of different wine people working in other wineries. And so a friend of mine uh, was working um, at a winery that owned Henry Ranch and they sold the vineyard to a grower that I had been working with on another project. And they called me and was like, hey, I know you're looking for Chenin Blanc for your new, uh, for, your, for your label that you're starting. Um, so I called up the grower, Josh, um, he's a great guy. And I was like, hey, I'd love to come see the vineyard. And he was like, oh, we'll come up right now. So I went up um called Natalie she came up and we were like this is this is what we want this is this is the dream these huge fat old vines um crazy little hillside vineyard um and so uh we 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 lucked out big time that we got a piece of this vineyard well it's it's interesting that you said he knew I was looking for Shannon oh so, my friend Kenny knew yeah but why were you looking for Shannon we so Natalie and I wanted to produce a Shannon our our first vintage, our vision was to have a, a light bodied red and an aromatic white to start with. Um, and so we, we chose Pinot Noir and Chenin Blanc, um, but we didn't have the mm. contract for Chenin Blanc yet. And so I, we needed to, we needed to find some. And um, there are, there are options in, you know, the, the Central Coast and in, in Clarksburg and everything like that, but we really wanted um, Napa. Our, our entire brand is all Napa fruit and we're trying to stick to that as best we can. And so, um, you know, we, we knew, 
We knew we wanted that's it. Typical. And I talked to my friends about it. No, and, and that's, that's, I think, an important attribute of the small producer, specifically in Napa and Sonoma. And, and Natalie, you touched upon this very early on when you were a consumer and you said, you know, where else should I go taste? And, and they will, it's the, honestly, the only industry that I've seen this where it's 100% authentic all the time. They will legitimately, honestly, and authentically tell you where to go. And they will say, you know, go check with Susan up the road at such and such. She's doing an incredible project with Viognier or go over and talk, tell Tom I sent you a mile away. Uh, they've got some cab franc that's to die for and stuff like that. And they genuinely mean it because I, I think they recognize, understandably so, that a rising tide lifts all boats. So if, if the consumer has a good experience, which you did, and then that lends itself well with you, Shana, knowing the context that you have, and I, I'm shocked that you're helping make wine at 18 different locations. So- Oh, well, not uh, different locations. Uh, no, 18 different producers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably 50 different locations. Uh, but, but you're right. So that's where you get to kind of like a chef. You can pick a little bit of here. You get to learn from this person over here. You can just weave all of that knowledge and experience into your own maturation process and growth process with what you two are trying to do. Uh, that's fantastic. Jeff Greasy, you answered your own question because he said, I'm confused here. I thought Chablis was Chardonnay. French Chablis is Chardonnay. Uh, the Americans kind of just borrowed that label, threw it on bottles and it was Chenin. So uh, in the seventies, crazy stuff. All right, last trivia question. And uh, we're going to sweeten the pot a little bit. There's going to be 500 on this one because not everybody, there's been no unanimous question answered by the group. So we normally only do two, but this will be a tiebreaker. Well, Shana has been making wine since 08. Natalie is relatively new to the process, but her favorite winery chore is what? Punch downs of the ferment cap, toasting barrels without instruction, <laughs> cleaning tanks with the high powered fire hose, driving forklift and moving full <laughs> barrels. This is like a coin flip, isn't it, Natalie? I could see myself enjoying any of these tasks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna give this five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. Oh, it was a late entry into the toasting barrels with, with, without instruction. So I thought maybe the audience was fearful of you and fire, but someone took a leap of faith. Uh, but why don't you tell the audience what is your favorite thing to do in the production side? I just have such a vision of myself, like with like a fake flamethrower, like toasting barrels right now. <laughs> Doesn't that sound cool? It sounds fun, but dangerous. Um, yeah, punch downs. So, um, the way Shana taught me how to do punch downs with our Pinot Noir, um, we make such, uh, we, we make such small batches that we're able to do our punch downs by hand. And, uh, I have these long summer arms that could reach and, um, Shana taught me to, you know, sanitize up to your shoulder. You lean over the barrel or, or the bin um, of, of must and juice and all that and and literally just swim through the wine. Um, there's a picture of me from my Instagram. Um, you use your arms kind of like an oar um, and in swimming there's a drill called sculling that um, my last four years uh, of my swimming career I was training with uh, Dave Durden and he made a skull so much. So I got really good at sculling and, uh, the movement is very much like sculling. So you're just, uh, pushing down the, the top of the, the cap. Um, so the cap is the, the top of the ferment and you want it to, um, have an even moistness. You want it to ferment evenly. So you just kind of mix everything together and, um, it has the best smell while you're doing it. Uh, it's such a great, a way to literally get in your wine and feel it and, and be one with it. Uh, I absolutely love that. That's my favorite chore. And I wish we could do it all the time, but you know, it's only this well, small and, window. <laughs> and Shana, help me out here. That is usually the least favorite chore by people because they're normally using a punch down apparatus and they've got to lean over the tank and push the cap all the way down and continue this whole process. And it's mind numbingly boring. Um, well, we do still sometimes use the punch down tool, but in a bin, it's, you know, it's much smaller and easier, but it's still right. a good abdominal workout, you know, when you're up there doing workout. it. So, yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, 
but yeah, nobody hates it. It can be exhausting, but, um, but yeah, it's, I, I love doing it still and I've been doing it forever. So yeah, it's a good one. It good. is a good workout. Wow. And, and we need to get <laughs> Natalie certified on the forklift so that she can drive around with full barrels. So next year, I'll you a free <laughs> certification. <laughs> I would love that. Yeah. I could just see Natalie's eyes going, oh, the, the forklift sounds fun. The flamethrower and the barrels. Now that I could get into. This will be yeah, good. Combining all of it, the flamethrower and the forklift. <laughs> I like it. All right. We're going to turn on cameras for those of you that have signed the waiver and are not in witness protection. Now is your time for fame. Uh, let us know where you are. I am going to talk a little bit about the Shannon and show you exactly where the Shannon is from, because it comes from a very famous place called Pope Valley, but not many people know of Pope Valley. So it is Jeff Greasy's favorite time of the evening. It is Google Earth time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this time we are going to start actually in Europe. Can you see the globe? Okay. Um, sharing helps. There we go. 71 weeks, still still a little rusty on the controls. All right, so, so here is France. And for those of you that remember our crash course in Burgundy and Bordeaux, France is literally the epicenter for all things wine in the world for the most part. Uh, but the Loire Valley is a pretty special place. And it is, you hear me talk all the time about the impact of water and wine. And so here you have the Loire Valley. It's a rather large valley. I mean, it's, it's huge. You've got these rivers here. You've got rivers up here. The name actually came from um, Mount Chenin or Mont Chenin, which is near Vouvray. And for those of you that have ever seen Vouvray on a wine bottle, it is Chenin Blanc. And usually when you can find it at a restaurant, since most people don't know that it's Chenin Blanc, those are usually at a, a, a quality to price ratio on the wine list that are outstanding. So uh, you can knock it out of the park with many Vouvray's on restaurant wine lists. But here you can see just how big this valley is. And it's just all vineyards. And it's separated to a middle, a center, <laughs> an upper and a lower. And the other thing about the Loire Valley is it has another one of our, our favorite regions. It has Chinon. Chinon is in the Loire Valley. And for those, I just saw Shana just kind of almost wistfully fall into a daydream because she knows that's Cab Franc. And some of the best Cab Franc in the world comes from Chinon. Here's Vouvray. Uh, so all of this for the most part in the central region of the Loire Valley is Chenin Blanc. There's a lot of it there. Uh, uh, the Anjou region is famous for it, but it's just a neat area based again upon all the water uh, and, and the mountains and the ridges and stuff like that. We, we won't go into the soil types, but let's get to the area of the world. Grab your air sickness bag that we're familiar with because uh, the travel is spectacular. And, and here we have the wine region, which we know and love and which uh, both Shane and Natalie have called home for the better part of two or nearly two decades, uh, Natalie all her life. But you, you have a huge maritime influence, not too dissimilar to the rivers and regions and, and lakes and stuff that ran through Loire Valley, you have a lot of water in Napa that you don't normally see off the beaten path because many people spend their time in the valley and on the valley floor. You got to get off into the foothills. Sonoma has tons of rivers in it and tons of lakes. And obviously there's the maritime influence of the Pacific, uh, the whole Petaluma Gap and everything that the, you know, nature's air conditioner, the San Pablo Bay is, is not, uh, Natalie doesn't swim in the San Pablo Bay, even with the wetsuit, that's, that's kind of chilly. But where we're gonna go is Pope Valley. And Pope Valley is over here. And by the way, during this week's trivia question, no one got the answer correct on the email blast about the two AVAs that straddle Pope Valley. So that $500 goes back to the house. I apologize, there were no winners. Uh, the two AVAs are Howell and Childs AVA, because you have Howell Mountain AVA and Childs Valley. But then Henry Ranch is way up here. So this gives you an idea as you're moving up through South Napa, through Yountville, Rutherford, St. Helena. Very few people get past St. Helena. I mean, there's a whole wine world up here. 
uh, in Calistoga and, you know, the folks at Auberge and Solage and Four Seasons, they're now recognizing all this because they're building giant hotels up there. Uh, but Pope Valley and, and both Shana and Natalie can educate everybody on how famous Pope Valley was, but they have this wonderful little vineyard called the Henry Ranch. And it is magical because you can see as, as I zoom in here, just how old and gnarly these vines are. They're the ones behind me. And for wine people, when you see gnarly vines like that, it's just like, you just get all excited because it's like a warm hug with these big giant roots and everything. And it's just so cool in these trunks. Um, but I'll let you talk about this vineyard, Shana, and these 50 plus year old vines. Sure, yeah. So um, this vineyard uh, was purchased in 1972 um, and the Chenin Blanc had already been planted and was mature. So, um, so we know that the vines date back to at least the late 1960s. Um, and then, and you can kind of see the, the demarcation between the Chenin Blanc and the Cabernet Sauvignon, which is a little bit higher up the hill. And that's where yep. our Cabernet comes from as well. So we're getting both, um, both pieces of this property. Um, but the, the Chenin Blanc had been farmed it looks like at some point, some of it was head trained and then eventually went on to cordon train and now we cane prune certain parts of it as well. So it's a little bit spotty throughout because they're super old vines. And so we're, um, we're they're kind of a little bit all over the place and they, um, they ripen slightly different from one another, but they, they have all this great concentrated flavor. Um, and there are some baby vines in there that you might be able to see right up, um, right near where the Cabernet Sauvignon starts over on the left-hand side. Um, that's a new planting. Um, oh, my left. Yeah. Yeah, there. Uh, so that's just two tiny little rows uh, that are planted to Chenin Blanc now um, that were planted this year. So maybe in four or five years, we'll start getting some more from two more rows. Um, that's for us. <laughs> but, yeah, there, um, there's, your, there's your nod to patience, Natalie. <laughs> But everything else is, is well over 50 year old, um, 50 year old grapevines. Um, and, um, and yeah, so it's, um, it's on the backside of the hill. I don't know if you can zoom out to the Pope Valley map again, but you can see like Angwin and then there's kind of a mountain ridge and there's a little bit of an afternoon shade. Um, yeah, that comes from it right there. So even though it gets very, very hot uh, late in the day, uh, we are uh, blessed with getting a little bit of uh, shade from the hills that break between Pope Valley and Anguin. Um, yeah, just a cool little spot. And it, and it yeah. does, it does get hot. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about soil structure and, and why mm -hmm. Because Shannon's a very vigorous vine. So why does it do so well here? So part of it, I think, is that the vines are so old, you know, so older vines tend not to be as vigorous or fruitful as younger vines do. And so they've sort of put themselves into check. Uh, the soil is a combination of clay loam and there it's all soils in Napa have some volcanic element to them as well. Um, so it lends themselves really nicely to pretty much any Vitus vinifera vine. Um, but it's, um, it's kind of to the point where the vines are so old, they cannot overproduce. And rootstock would have been rootstock from the late 1960s. So we're not looking at um, an 1103 Paulson rootstock where you're gonna have these huge, big shoots. It's gonna be something old that um, AXR1 or St. George or something like that. Um, so it, it's, it'll, that'll help to keep the vines um, in check as well. And it's interesting because if you, if you haven't seen the video with uh, Natalie and Shana from Cellar Angels, uh, definitely go to that video, like it, subscribe, uh, because that's how we generate more interest for the two of them in Guderian Wines. But we film in the Henry Ranch video and we talk a little bit about Pope Valley. And when you look at all the vineyards here in Pope Valley, Pope Valley is kind of like old Napa. It, it's, it's where a lot of the famous producers from the Gallows, from the Mandavis, from you, you know, you look at St. Supri, they've got a lot of land back here. 
But interesting, if you go back to the early and mid 1800s, it was a hot springs kind of medicinal area. And there was a resort called Etna Springs. And for the political junkies, Ronald Reagan launched his governor announcement for the uh, office of governor from the stairs of Etna Springs. The resort is now <laughs> defunct, uh, but it's, it's got an amazing history. It's kind of like if you ever been to Tucson and you go to old Tucson where they filmed all the Westerns and stuff like that outside of Tucson, it's just this old town, but I definitely encourage you to get, you know, past Howell mountain and, and come and visit some of the folks in, in Pope Valley uh, because there's a ton of vineyards out here that really don't get a lot of visitors. And there's some amazing fruit coming off these vines. So you get the cab from here and the cab is a new release. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, 20, uh, 2019 was our first year getting the Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, we were we were already in the vineyard there getting Chenin Blanc. And so even though I wasn't contracted for Cabernet, when I'd be there sampling for Shannon, I'd just kind of like hop over to the Cabernet side where uh, I think Josh Phelps was getting the, the Cabernet and I would like taste the fruit. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is really good. This is really flavorful. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we can get a little bit of it. So we did a little bit um, in 19 and we were hoping to do it in 20, but you know, that didn't work out because of fires. And then uh, we just harvested um, on the 16th. September 16th for, um, uh, from this vineyard, uh, the Cabernet this year. So we'll have more. I like it. Now, how many cases of the Cabernet did you produce? We produced uh, 98 cases. Nine, 98. Uh, yeah. Not 980, not 9,800, just 98. This 98 is what limited, limited production is all about. And there's only 145 cases of the Shannon, which is just a screaming good wine. Uh, Natalie, how did you two come up with the name Gadarian? Yeah, so we, I mean, it's it's difficult to name anything um, <laughs> and to be creative and different. And um, I found Gadarian and it's the old English word for to gather or bring together. And that's what we, you know, look at all of us. We're all across the country drinking wine, uh, gathering together. And so we just thought that was such a perfect uh, name for, for our brand. Um, so we love it. Uh, it means to bring together a gather in old English. And, and the logo or the, the mascot. jackalope, the mascot <laughs> the, on the bottle, my little, my little mascot right here. For those of you um, that can't see the mascot, <laughs> uh, do not blame me for, I, I'm immediately thinking of the character or creature in Monty Python and the Holy Grail that was <laughs> not kind to people at the bridge of truth. Uh, so tell me about the jackalope. So well, we love uh, go ahead, Shana. Okay. My bad. <laughs> so um, so first vineyard that we started working with was Sunset Knoll Vineyard, which is where we get our Pinot Noir and uh, where we make our rosé from. And um, you in know, Canaros. we have many yeah, that's in Carneros. Um, and there are jackalopes throughout the vineyard who are protecting our grapevines. So um, sort of in an homage to them for protecting our vines, we put them on our bottle. Um, yeah. So the, is it kind of like the, the large rabbits that you see in Arizona on golf courses that are like two feet high? Those oh, it's, yeah, they're just jackrabbits, but I, you know, we've... <laughs> <laughs> there's one right here. here. I, I, yes. <laughs> honestly, Natalie, I'm going to have nightmares if I see more of that. Thing. That, <laughs> that thing is horrifying. Um, but I do I like it. Him. So does does the what did you, I'm sorry, Snookums? Is that what the name I, was? No, I said I love him. Oh, I love <laughs> Let, let's is, name him Snookums. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Schnookums works. I like, I was just going to ask, it's my understanding that the jackalope does not have a name. So I, I think there's easily someone could ante up and we could all throw a hat, you know, money into the hat and, and Schnookums might be the odds. I, I kind of love it. <laughs> yes, please, please feel free to suggest names for the, for the jackalope water bottle. <laughs> and, and the 98 cases of cab that you produced, is that from 19 fruit, 21 fruit? What, what is that from? That's 2019. So the 2021 is still fermenting in one of our, our bins right now. Um, so that, does, yeah, it, that's does, cool. does it have a cap on it? Natalie's curious and, and wondering if she can push that down. Oh yeah. It's time for her to come and punch that down. <laughs> that is awesome. I, I, we need some video of this. I just, 
just and I the sculling thing, I, I'm not comprehending the sculling thing. Sculling, I thought sculling was like a boat. Yeah, but if you think of your arms like an oar, we're sculling with our arms. So you go like that. We'll send you a video. Awesome. We're posting that. Uh, all right. So you you founded the company. How do you two make decisions together? How do you chart a path for the for Guderian? I'll I'll, I'll start of, I, since Shane is going, oh boy. Uh, I'll start with Natalie. <laughs> yeah, we just kind of um we make decisions as we go a, a lot of times. Like we have a plan, like Shane alluded to in the beginning. Um, we have a plan and then kind of like I said, you have you have to pivot. You have to be willing to be flexible. And you know, it, it it's something as simple as a text of, hey, I think we could do this. This would be really exciting. Or I tasted this wine. Like, what if we did this to ours? Um, you know, comments here and there. And um, and then also just listening to the wine. Like Shana is the expert on the winemaking side. Um, she knows how to coax it into be the best wine it could be. Um, and I just know what I like as a consumer. <laughs> and Shane, anything to add? Because let me, I mean, because right now you're, is it 100% cab? Oh, no, you said you're doing some Merlot with it. So for, so both. So I, we have it, have a separate. So I have a 100% Cabernet Sauvignon that's fermenting. I have 100% Merlot. And then we have one that's a co-ferment. So it's going to be three different wines. Um, so I think I think our red wines. Um, yeah. And then um I just want to kind of point out how important it is for me to have Natalie as a sounding board for things because I get so wrapped up in all of the the winemaker esque speak and all this stuff being in the cellar every day and to have her come in um, she's up here frequently but she's not constantly in the, in the with the numbers to taste it and tell me honestly this is what I think this is how I feel and this is what other people are probably going to perceive that's really really helpful. Well, and it's yeah. also a, a credit to you to be able to recognize that because it's kind of one of those scenarios where you're so far in the forest, you can't see the trees. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and Natalie comes in from the outside and says, okay, let's recalibrate. Here's mm -hmm. what I'm getting here. And, you know, and then it's a perfect uh, yin and yang to it. For sure. Yeah. For sure. I get like little snapshots along the way of how it's fermenting and how it's tasting. And, um, and Shana is so deep, like you said, in the weeds every single day. Um, so yeah, we have different perspectives, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really fun partnership and I think we work really well together. And then the, the blending has always fascinated us from just a, a project, a process. And we've had a lot of great winemakers on talking about the blending process. And I'm always interested, especially when there's more than one person doing it mm -hmm. as there is in this case. So is it you're sitting at a long table and you've got these all these beakers and tubes and, and you two are just kind of oh, a little pinch of that. And then Natalie, you've got your culinary background going, nope, it needs a little bit from this spice rack. I mean, how, how does that whole process go? Um, I, I, I was, it's not quite like that for the Gazarian brand. Um, so far, um, all of our wines have been um, single vineyard wines. So when we're blending, we're making our blend decisions based on, on barrels, you know? So, um, you know, last year for the 2020 Chenin Blanc, we selected the four best barrels and I ended up selling my two least favorite barrels um, after aging because I want to make sure that we have the best wine going uh, into our bottle. But um, but we don't have, you know, 15 different Cabernets to choose from and, and, and blend right. all together. It'll be a little bit more like that this year now that we have the Merlot and the Cabernet and we have our separate ferments. And, and in those separate ferments, we have different aging vessels. Um, so we will be able to do a little bit of that. But, but in general, our our, our blending is we're we're picking what the best vessels are and blending those together. Give me an example of a vessel that you're excited about. Oh gosh, yes. Yeah. So today we filled our uh, we got this awesome punchin from uh, Valerine uh, Cooperage in France. It's it's a it's a a Reef Droit barrel. We're the only ones in the U.S. that have this punchin, and I filled it up today with our Merlot. When we press our reds, we don't press them to a tank um, and, and chill them and settle them and rack them. We press them directly to barrel. So we're keeping the leaves in the barrel for um, a good while until it finishes secondary fermentation. So we just drained 
the juice out of the bin, filled up this huge puncheon, and then pressed a little bit to get a little bit of extra juice. And that went into a tiny barrel next to it. So we'll use this, this tinier barrel to top up the ginormous barrel that holds uh, 132 gallons of Merlot. Wow, that's exciting. And I also like the fact that you're the only ones in the United States that have that. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping from an environmental standpoint that that's not a single use device. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so we can read. <laughs> well, definitely plan to reuse this barrel. Um, but when we reuse it, it's going to be something entirely different. So right now we're using right. it as a brand new vessel, right? So when when we use it again in the future, we're going to have to think about uh, what what we might want to put in there. It probably won't be Merlot. When we use it again, it'll probably be Pinot Noir. So um, so mm. yeah, then it'll be it'll be totally changed because we'll have used that first twenty two months of oak presence will be in the in the Merlot. In the Merlot, awesome. Now I'm excited for that one. And so on the Shannon note. What did you do with this from your fermentation process and barrel or stainless? Walk us through how it got to bottle. Yeah, so our, our Chenin Blanc is barrel fermented. So we, we whole cluster press our Chenin Blanc. Um, we do a really light pressing. Uh, so we have nice light cuvee notes. And then it all goes into either neutral or once used French oak barrels and stainless steel drums. So last year we were, um, let's see, so we were about 75% um, oak and 25% um, stainless steel. And we ferment in those vessels. And once primary fermentation is done, we top the wine up. Um, we let it hang out on the lees for another six to nine months. And then oh, wow. we rack all of that off of the settled lees and we put it back into the neutral French oak barrels to finish the aging process before we put it in bottle. That's a fairly impressive and complex uh, and wonderfully successful process. <laughs> it's not. It's not as crazy as it as it sounds. It's, uh, but um, but it, it seems to work really well. It helps enhance the mouthfeel and and really helps with our aromatics. And so it's it's worked out really great so far. You know, and and I think this has been an, a very successful bottling. The Shen and the, the nineteen is, or I'm sorry, the the, yeah, the, the nineteen, 19 yeah. is, is delicious. Thank How you. do you two? And I'll go to you first, Natalie. How would you define success for Gadarian? Sharing a wine that both of us are proud of. And so far, we're very proud of our wines. Um, that's That's been number one, in, in my mind, at least. Um, this isn't just something that we want to create and... Um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll make money doing this. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> needs a, pay, a, a paycheck, but, um, overrated. This, yeah. But this is, this is a product that we're very, very proud of and that I'm excited every time I open one of our bottles. Um, I, it, it should, it should be old news to me, but it's not, I love it. Like the fact that I get to open a Shannon and enjoy with you guys. I'm so happy to do that. Um, and getting the brand out there. Um, and I, I know for speaking for myself, um, being an Olympian and an athlete, like I didn't want to just create something that was, you know, slapping my, my name onto some bulk wine. Like I love the fact that we take so much care into our brand. Shana is such an amazing winemaker. Um, both of us have a lot of attention to detail and hopefully it shows in, in the bottle. Shana, any uh, addition to that definition of success? Sure. I mean, I think that's pretty spot on. Um, the only thing I would add is that for me, my goal when I'm making wine um, is I want to evoke a positive emotion in those that taste the wine. So um, I, if, if, if I can add to somebody's meal, I can add to somebody's get together with their friends, their day off. Maybe they had a shit day at work and they can open up this bottle of wine and make it just a little bit better. That to me is a huge success. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and then getting to, to work with Natalie on a project of our own and, and kind of make it how we want and how we love it. It's just uh, icing on the cake. No, that is actually pretty cool to go in business with a friend and actually produce things that are consumed by people that are enjoying it and you're the two behind it. So that, that's fantastic. Speaking of, of tasting great wine with great people, how do people come taste with you? Natalie, you want to give us an idea of how that happens? <laughs> you contact us and we'll give you a vineyard tour and uh, we'll, we'll sneak in some bottles of wine. As <laughs> um, Yeah, you have to contact us. It's an appointment only. Do you want me to do you want me to type my email address in the little thing or would that go on YouTube? Uh, 
do that. Denise will do that. Mission Control okay. will take care of that. Uh, okay. So basically, they can set up an appointment with you, hit you through the website, and you know I'm going to be in the valley, and then it's appointment only. They just can't show up, uh, knock on the patio door. So how would you describe your, your current case production is what? So current case production is roughly 500 cases a year. Um, and the dream production? Dream production is about 3,000. So we, we have a ways to go, <laughs> but we'll get there. And, and really, last but not least, is jackalope a dark meat? <laughs> I think so. I think it's like a chicken thigh. <laughs> <laughs> Shane is a vegetarian, so uh, yeah, I, I would imagine it probably tastes very similar to a chicken pie. <laughs> Karen was very curious because there was a lot of debate on whether or not it was white meat, if it was in the Snipe family, uh, an old, I believe, an old Cheers reference. Uh, from definitely Snipe in the Snipe family, yes, for sure. <laughs> definitely in the Snipe family. <laughs> that is outstanding. Well, as we say every week at Seller Angels, we have a chance to work, to do work we're proud of, and we hopefully do it for people that are inspired, that enjoy it, and actually want to share it with other people. And I think this is, without a doubt, two individuals that share that passion because they are working tirelessly. Shana has joined us in the middle of harvest. And as you heard, she's working with 18 different producers. So that in and of itself is insanity. So I want to give everybody a raise a glass to uh, Shana and Natalie, and, and thank you so much for, uh, for everything. Cheers to all of you and, and health and happiness and, and success to all of you. And to all of the angels out there, thank you so much for spending a little bit of your Friday night with us. We are indebted. As we say, we don't have customers, we have supporters. And all of you inside the tent are huge supporters of ours and huge supporters of great limited producers like Guderian Wines. Stay safe, everyone. Have a great weekend. Uh, the USA is up five and a half to one and a half in the Ryder Cup. So cheers.